The eighth question you ask yourself when doing educational analysis has to do with the relationship between the teacher and his or her students. Now, as with the other questions, this divides into two parts. Firstly, we'll take a look at the boundary strength between uh, teachers and students. And there we'll make a distinction between a solid boundary, in which case the teacher has a very positional relationship where it's very clear that she is the teacher and the learners are learners, or a more open boundary where the teachers and the learners tend to exist on a more friendly and flexible and personal uh, level. Secondly, we'll take a look at the substance of the nature of the relationships between teachers and students, and there I will argue that there are four basic types of relationships that uh, teachers have with students and these range from a communal sharing to an authority ranking to an attempt to work with equality matching and finally with market pricing which I will go through with a very strange and peculiar diagram which I had some fun doing. In fact uh, this whole um, session is dominated by two very peculiar diagrams which I really really like so let's get going and take a look at the first one now firstly let me talk a little bit about the nature of the dynamic and the difficulty when working with uh, relationships between students and teachers and I think this gorgeous trick catches the issue on the one side you have a teacher who is in a relationship of authority to the student. Now this is always the case. By definition, a teacher has something to teach, so is in a relationship of authority to the student. But the teacher can decide to make that relationship open and friendly and equal. But that is the decision of the teacher. It's from a position of authority that the teacher makes the decision to be equal. It's very different for the student. The student cannot make that decision. So never mistake the fact that the teacher is in authority. And I think this is symbolized in this picture by the ladder where the student at the bottom uh, recognizes the fact that the teacher is on top and the teacher has a position of authority. Now, I want to make a distinction between two types of authority that the teacher wields because I think it is absolutely vital. Firstly, the teacher can be in positional authority and you respect the teacher because the teacher is older, because the teacher is often male, because the teacher is a teacher. That's the grounds of the respect. It's a positional respect. And in a lot of traditional cultures, teachers have got their authority by the very nature of who they are, their actual position. But within uh, more what I would call more modern cultures where there's a tendency towards more democratic relations you have a situation where the teacher's authority doesn't rest on the fact that he or she is a male or he or she is old or he or she has the term or title teacher it rests with the in the authority of the subject the teacher is an authority in the subject not in authority because he or she is a teacher and that is the grounds for respect but notice that with both those terms you have a situation where the teacher is clearly the person who knows more or who has more power or both than the student but at the same time you've got to love the way this uh, diagram catches the fact that the teacher and the student are actually on the same level now this catches the more open dynamic that happens with between teachers and students where the teacher has a more open boundary. The teacher allows the student to have some say and some control over what is done in the lesson and how it is done in the lesson. It's a personal relationship where the teacher opens out who she is in the hope and the expectation, sometimes the forced expectation, that the student does the same thing. And what you have is you have a situation where the teacher and the student exist as human beings, as individuals, as warm, living human creatures working in the same space together. And they have to actually get on in uh, ways where, which human beings actually get on in. So there you have a diagram which catches the complexity of this dynamic. Uh, on the one side, the teacher is 
an authority. The teacher knows the subject uh, and that creates a ladder. On the other side, the teacher is a teacher. The teacher has a higher status and that can have to do with the fact that the teacher is older or, or sometimes male and that gives authority. But there are far more open dynamics which occur because teachers and students are working in the same space all the time. They have to get to know each other. You lock people up in a room and you force them to be with each other, which is what schooling does for around five, six hours a day. You have to get to know the people that you're working with. It's as simple as that. And that opens out the more personal dynamic and more open dynamic between teachers and learners. That said, I do want to take a look at what the nature of the, um, the relationships are between uh, teachers and students. And here I'm going to pick up on the work of Fisk, who's a very interesting and underrated guy within education. Uh, and he basically developed a, a scheme through research where he came up with four foundational and fundamental types of relationships which operate amongst us as a human species. Now, what you'll see, firstly, is you'll see that uh, the first kind of relationship is communal sharing and that is where in a community you share things together you are basically one you are united you are together and you're against if anything another group outside of you but inside that group you have a common unity secondly you have an authority ranking and what's quite interesting about this is is that it means that within the group you focus now within the group and within the group there's just a simple order relationship between those who are higher than others the teacher is higher than the students simple as that authority ranking but what happens within the group as well as the relationships get more sophisticated is you cannot just work with an ordinal relationship. You also start to pay attention to the ways that the actual learners are working separately and together. And the teacher lands up in a position where the teacher tries to make sure that the different students actually get an equal chance to participate and do the things that are being done in the class. And I've seen this time and time again where teachers will uh, ignore the kid who's always got his hands up and try and find the other kids to answer the questions because they want to have a situation where everyone has an equal chance and, and Fisk calls that equality matching. Finally, the fourth kind of relationship is unfortunately named to my mind. He called it market pricing. But what he's really referring to there is a situation where the teacher recognizes the individual value of the student's contribution in its own terms. It's not an attempt to get an equality going. It's not an attempt to get an authority relationship going. The teacher looks at the student's work and rates it according to what it's worth at that moment, at that time, in terms of the student's work itself. Now, I've tried to catch the story in a, a, a kind of like an iconic picture. Um, and let's just go through it uh, so you can see it. And then I'll tell a story to kind of relate the four relationships together. Firstly, you have the communal relationship. And that's symbolized by the teacher and the learner uh, holding hands together as a, as, a, as a group, as a unit, as a unity trying to move forward. Secondly, they're climbing a ladder, they're climbing the ladder of knowledge, and on that ladder, the teacher knows more than the student and is above the student and is in an authority relationship to the student because of that. Thirdly, you have a situation where you have the ladder and the teacher kind of balancing, uh, and the, the balancing beam which they're acting on, uh, working on, is trying to catch the fact that they're trying to match and balance the different kinds of relationships which are going on to keep them equal, to keep them level. And finally, they are balancing on wh whatever there look like two balls, but it's actually a colon. Uh, a colon is a symbol in mathematics for ratio. And by ratio, what we're trying to point to is we're trying to point to the fact that the teacher actually gives the student what the student actually deserves in terms of where the student actually is, not in terms of some kind of equality matching in its own terms. 
And that catches the situation uh, in, a, in a diagram between the four relationships. Uh, to illustrate the case, let me use a very simple example. I have me, myself, I used to be, a, um, for my sins, I used to be a phys ed teacher for some of the time. And uh, it was a very interesting dynamic to be, for example, a rugby coach. And in that situation, when I arrived with my team, I was absolutely one of the team. We were a group. There was a situation where there was a communal sharing where we all acted as one against the other team. But secondly, there was a situation where I was the coach. I was in command. I made the decisions. The, the students, the players had to listen to me in terms of what was going on. But thirdly, I was in a difficult position where I had to make sure that all my different team members actually got a chance to play the game. Some were definitely better than others. There was no two ways about that. But I had to ensure that they all got a chance because it was so important to me to see uh, the various learners enjoying and participating and having the chance to actually express themselves. It was also, by the way, very important for uh, the mothers and the fathers. But that's another story. But finally, in terms of what we call market pricing, or in terms of the actual value of the child in their own terms, depending on what they could do, there were definite situations in terms of the game where there was no two ways about it. I knew that the one student or the one player was the best player in that situation, and then I played him, no matter what, because that what was needed in terms of the game, uh, and I made that decision in its own terms. So, when dealing with the eighth question in terms of the relationship between the teacher and the student, firstly take a look at the boundary strength. Understand that it's a complex situation where the teacher is always in, in command, always has authority, but as an authority can actually seed, open out the authority to the uh, students and open out to more a, a personal and um, shared uh, authority relation. In terms of the solid boundary strength, make a distinction on the one side between the teacher being in an authority because of the fact that uh, he or she is a teacher and it's because of their position that they're there and have got the authority or uh, it's about their subject knowledge, the fact that they actually do know what they're talking about which gives them the authority. Uh, and always bear in mind that it's a very weird uh, situation where, as an authority, you're also allowing the space for a more personal relationship to open up with the students themselves. Secondly, note that there are four types of relationships that go from very simple group dynamics of communal sharing to a situation in the group where you have an authority ranking between uh, top and bottom, Thirdly, where within the group you attempt to make sure that everyone has a fair chance and everyone gets a, a fair shake. And fourthly, the situation where you rate the person on what they're actually worth and what they actually do.